Okay. Yeah, we can. Okay. So this is about critical thinking, inoculating yourself against false beliefs. I had to use that subtitle in the age of the pandemic. So I want to say that this is a 20 minute presentation, uh, which was cut down from an hour plus. So I did take um, a lot of interesting stuff out, unfortunately, to fit it in here, but I tried to keep the center core of it. What's missing is a lot of examples to uh, illustrate my points, and I had a lot of videos. Um, I will give you the link to the full presentation at the end of this. Um, so another point is I created this talk, not for skeptics, but for humanist organizations. I was actually asked to do it for recovering from religion. They do a weekly presentation. And uh, so a lot of this might be obvious to skeptics, I don't know, but hopefully everyone will learn at least something. Okay, so the talk is about that our brains evolved in order to have us survive in a harsh environment, and they're not perfect, they're just good enough to allow us to reproduce and raise offsprings, right? So understanding this fact that it's just good enough, it's not perfect, having neuropsychological humility is one key to critical thinking. And that term was coined, as far as I know, by Steve Novella. He expounded upon it in the book, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Fantastic, if you haven't read it, by the way. Uh, and this was his description of it, which was actually written in an article he wrote for Skeptical Inquirer. Being a functional skeptic requires knowledge of all the various ways in which we deceive ourselves. It limits and flaws in human perception and memory. I'm going to go into that the inherent biases and fallacies in cognition. I'll go a little into that. And the methods that can help mitigate all these flaws and biases. Presentations in two large sections, functional limitations of your brain and reasoning errors that you make. All right, the first part's broken up to sensory input errors. The, this is the data getting into your brain isn't perfect. The data handling, it's not handled in a perfect manner. And then when you try to retrieve it, there are memory issues. The reasoning portion is, we're gonna talk quickly about cognitive biases and logical fallacies. All right, so the first portion. So one important aspect of critical thinking, thinking uh, skeptically, is understanding the limitations of perception and memory. That's the functional limitations of your brain. People generally understand memory is imperfect, even if they don't realize just how bad it actually is, but they assume the senses, vision particularly, uh, give us a reasonably accurate view of the world around us. I know what I saw is the common refrain, somebody you know, claiming something that you maybe don't believe. So let's talk in detail about the sensory input errors. And we're gonna concentrate on the sense of vision because it's the one that humans at least use to see the world or understand the world the most. We do not see the world around us in full or even as it really is, right? Human vision is unreliable, it's imperfect. Your eyes have flaws that you would never accept in a camera. If you bought a camera with the flaws we have, you'd bring it back. You have a blind spot in your retina. Your optic nerve exits there and you see absolutely nothing in that spot. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. In the rest of the retina, you only see high res in a tiny area of your center of vision. If you hold your arm out, it's basically two times your thumbnail. That's the only part of your entire vision that's high resolution. And yet you don't realize that. Right. So this is because of this little tiny spot there we've evolved with the fovea and the graph on the right, which goes from zero to one, one being the best you can possibly see at a location is only one at the fovea and it drops off rather exponentially. Angularly around from it. And of course, at the blind spot, it goes to absolutely zero. Well, how come you don't notice this? Right. Also, the fovea is where most of the eyes color sensors are outside of that little tiny spot. Mostly your vision is grayscale. Again, you don't notice that. To support the phobia, half of the nerves coming from uh, of that part of your eye, the, the retina, are from that one spot. That little tiny spot gets half the nerves. So, somebody's not muted. So in a nutshell, outside of the phobia, vision is very low resolution and mostly shades of gray. You're effectively looking at the world through a small diameter tube, and you don't realize that. So we don't experience the world like that. And we don't notice the blind spot. We don't notice the grayness. We don't notice the low res. Why is that? Well, the brain fools you into thinking everything is perfect. In high res and full color. So this is done because the way it's done is the brain is looking at the world and it knows this is the issue. So the eyes are automatically subconsciously commanded to shift gaze, to bring different portions of the scene sequentially into focus on that little spot in the phobia. This also fills in your blind spot, improves color perception, 
And then your brain stitches it all together at best it can in a very short time. And it gives you a view of, of the world, right? And there's another issue. You blink your eyes. About 10% of the time you're awake, your eyes are sending nothing to the brain. It's black, but you don't notice that, right? If you're watching a movie that flickered off 10% of the time, you damn well notice it and stop, stop the show. But your brain edits out this repeated blackness in your view of the world, and you never even notice it. So you take all that into account. Your brain's visual cortex combines all this less than perfect information and it constructs a broader view of the world. It presents you with a highly edited and manufactured reality that you experience as reflecting the universe exactly. <clears throat> it's actually just a model. It's an approximation of the environment that is good enough to get by. In fact, uh, Terry kind of mentioned that when she was talking about the, the blips that we see. Also, if something is not seen clearly or for a long enough time to get an accurate image, or it's just generally ambiguous, your brain gets confused and shows you what it thinks it saw. So that leads to all sorts of perceptual problems, including optical illusions, right? So here's one. This looks like it might've been constructed inside uh, a computer, a CGI image to show a rectangle floating over a piece of paper, but it's really a flat piece of paper, just cut in a certain angle. So that's what it looks like if you hold it out. Your eye just wants to see it in 3D. In fact, if you tip that paper over just a slight more, now you see a perfect cube over the paper. But again, it's just a flat piece of paper cut into a shape. Your brain can't see it any other way. This one I really like. So that is not a moving image. That is a still picture. And most of you should be seeing swirlings around the outside, which you can actually get dizzy from. So you can take a screenshot of that and later on prove it to yourself. It's not moving. Your brain thinks it is, so it tells you it is. Also, if that's not, not enough to convince you that your senses don't actually allow you to experience the world as it actually is, your eyes only see a tiny fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? We normally don't think about that. Everything else is invisible to us if it's not in that piece, but it's just as real as a tiny portion we can see. This illustrates the tiny percent of the uh, radio wave spectrum that our eyes turn into colors for our brain. And actually, this is kind of condensed because it goes off to infinity in the long range radio waves. It's a tiny portion. Other animals can see portions of the spectrum that we don't. Snakes see RR, bees see it in UV, right? But no species specific perception of the world is complete or could be called the correct one. And in fact, even members of the same species with perfectly functioning eyes and other organs may not experience reality in exactly the same way. So regarding our eyes, there was a thing called Dressgate, right? This was a photograph that went viral in 2015 and people argued ad infinitum about what color the dress was. Um, this was actually not just a little uh, glitch. This was an important thing that was subject in, of scientific investigations resulting in peer reviewed scientific papers as to what was going on here. What was this phenomenon? So what color is the dress? Leave it up for a few seconds. We put that in chat if you guys disagree about what color this is. So the official answer is uh, the dress has no color. People don't like that answer. At least not like it has volume, mass, temperature, and the other I'll call real properties of matter. Color is quite literally a figment of your imagination. Your brain makes it up. It's just a computation, which enables you to extract meaning from the world. And as you saw, not every brain computes it, that in this case, color the same way, right? This is a famous quote, color only exists in your head. There's no such thing as, there is such a thing as light. There is such a thing as energy, but there is no such thing as color. That's from a neuroscientist. And he wrote that up in a paper that you could look up. So our other senses such as hearing also have limitations, right? Some animals use sonar echolocation and maybe their brains present that information as what we would call color. And even that, not all members of one species agree on reality with that sense. Laurel, Laurel, Laurel. Right, some people hear one word there and some hear the other word. And that's also an interesting phenomenon. So then once all that information is imperfect in our brains, now there's a limit to how much we can actually get in there, right? Your brain actually ignores much of what the eyes and other sensors are trying to send it. This is a problem of the processing power of your brain. It's limited, just like computers are. 
There's a thing called inattentional blindness. You fail to observe a visible object in the scene when your attention is distracted. This is the famous case of trying to count pass basketball passes on a court while a gorilla walks across the scene and you don't notice the gorilla. There's also change blindness where you fail to notice a change of something, a color or something right in the scene in front of you. Because again, you're slightly not watching that particular thing. Not everything is deemed equally important. Maybe the brain didn't capture what color that was the first time, so it doesn't care it changed. So much is ignored. So now all of this flawed information is in your mind. Now the problem is you have to try to retrieve it, right? So going with, I know what I saw is, I remember it like it was yesterday. But of course, that's also ridiculous. Right? Human memory is imperfect. It's unreliable. A brain is not an organic recording and playback system. Can you accurately remember what something you've seen looks like that you've seen numerous times? Like, let's say a dollar bill, right? How many times have we looked at a dollar bill, the face of a dollar bill? Well, this is what like the result of a test typically is if someone tries to draw a dollar bill and, you know, putting it next to it, it's, it's somewhat uh, interesting that there are ones in the corners and there's a person in the center of it facing the runway, but everything else is wrong. And this is replicated where people try to draw the structure of a bicycle or uh, logos of the car they own, Volkswagen, Toyota, et cetera. So, you know, why does this happen? Well, the brain retrieves bits of information from past experiences that it tried to remember or saw. It stitches them together, fills in the gaps as best as possible, and it feeds you a story, which you perceive, because you have no choice, is accurate, live, reliable. Brain Games is a na National Geographic series which had eight seasons and fantastic information about this. I suggest if you're interested in the subject, look it up. Talked about perception and memory. Elizabeth Loftus, she's written books. Uh, she's a scientist who, who is uh, an expert on, on memory and that sort of thing. She's actually done experiments showing that a significant portion of the population can be convinced things happened to them in their life that didn't just by showing them pictures and talking about things. And then the memories formed there are false memories and they're just as real to those people from that point on as real memories. So given all that science has revealed about how poorly we see, how poorly we remember even ordinary things, it makes no sense to trust anyone's memory of what they remember as an extraordinary event. They claim something was paranormal or supernatural decades ago, last year, last month, or even just a minute ago. Uh, the famous quote, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? But it should be obvious now that any claim based exclusively on human senses and memory does not come even close to qualifying as extraordinary evidence. And yet, these famous lines all have one thing in common. I'm not gonna read them all, but most of you will find those familiar. And unbelievably, the thing in common is if you watch all the media that those are in, not one of those things is correct. So rather than people understanding memory is fallible, uh, there's a conspiracy theory, which uh, Steen and Klaus probably know about, called the Mandela effect. So this is where people believe that rather than your memory being wrong, that can't be, the universe has changed. And it used to be that way, and now it isn't, but you remember the old way. So uh, that includes other things besides quotes from movies and TV shows. Does the Monopoly man have a monocle? Uh, does Pikachu have a black stripe on his tail? Did Curious George have a tail at all? So people believe it one way, remember it one way or the other. And the people who believe in this conspiracy believe it used to be one way and now it looks different because the universe has changed and they have retained a memory of the old universe. This is a review that was published uh, on one on Amazon for one of the Mandela books. This person believes their blood type is no longer what a current reality said it is because he remembers it being different. So yes, people believe this. And I don't know if this was actually on The Simpsons or just a clever meme using Principal Skinner, but uh, it's, it's really good. So he's saying, uh, am I just misremembering all these things? And some of the common claims of Mandela myths, uh, conspiracies are all around him there. Uh, no, it's the universe is wrong. So, you know, that's a total lack of neuropsychological humility. Uh, and that's what people do. So what we tend to think is I know what I saw and I know what I remember. But according to neurologist Oliver Sacks, the reality is diametrically opposite. Every act of perception is to some degree an act of creation. And every act of memory is to some degree an act of imagination. That was my email signature for a while. So everything discussed uh, before this point concerns the physiological failings with the design of our body, 
uh, these are how we evolve, we cannot fix them. The only thing you can do is understand those limitations when making decisions about what you think and believe because of what's in your head, right? Now I'm going to discuss things that you can change. This is because they involve how you think, right? How, how your brain processes the data, the faulty data. Um, just like your physiological imperfections, your thinking process or reasoning is less than perfect, but at least you can be partially in control how you process this, how you think if you understand the problems. But you need to understand what the flaws are in order to work on changing those things. So the rest of the talk is gonna quickly go over two types of reasoning errors, cognitive biases and logical fallacies. So cognitive biases, most skeptics know about this, right? These are heuristics, fancy word for a shortcut in thinking which influence how we make decisions about what to believe, because your brain can't possibly absorb the whole entire world, as we talked about, and it doesn't get it right. So it's the brain's effort to simplify the world. Cognitive biases can lead to perceptual distortions, inaccurate judgments, illogical interpretation, all the bad stuff. And what we might broadly also call sometimes irrationality. Um, these biases are unconscious, but if we understand them, we can train our minds to use a different pattern of thinking and try to mitigate their effects on our beliefs and behavior. Uh, first one, confirmation bias, perhaps the mother of all biases, right? This is uh, talked about a lot. Basically, if you believe something, you're only going to accept and look at data and look for data that already confirms what you believe. And you're going to dismiss, not look at whatever data that possibly could make you change your mind. There's also motivated reasoning, somewhat connected, right? You might have a reason to continue to believe something. And this could be political, it could be religious, it could be anything. You don't want to be kicked out of the in-group if you're a flat earther. So you're just not going to look at the spherical earth uh, data. Status quo bias, humans generally don't like change. Uh, there's the bandwagon effect. Uh, you like to be uh, accepted by groups. You want to believe and do what other people are doing. Uh, the, the brain and eyes work together to create a, a, a bias to see things in images which aren't there called pareidolia, right? A religious person there might see that as an angel. Uh, we would realize it's just a random pattern of clouds. Uh, another religious image here, two of them, which people made some money from these. Uh, this is one that, that hit the uh, paranormal pseudoscience community because books were written on the face on Mars, the city on Mars, when this image was taken by the Viking orbiter in 1976. Because what else could that be but a human face? Well, you know, we sent another orbiter uh, many decades later, the Mars Global Surveyor uh, in 2001, and uh, much higher resolution, the lighting condition wasn't the same, and it, that's clearly not a, a construction of a face. And then there's this kind of pareidolia which people don't even make conspiracies of, but it's just hilarious. Chicken church. Um, so how do you overcome all of this, the pareidolia and, and the thought process biases? Well, you have to question what you believe to be true. You need to check for alternate explanations and contrary opinions and base your beliefs on verified facts, right? So let's talk about the last section here, logical fallacies. What are these? Well, a fallacy is a use of an invalid or otherwise faulty reasoning in the construction of an argument, and that could be to yourself or to someone else, the argument. They're, they're divided into formal and informal versions. We're going to talk quickly here about the informal fallacies. These contain reasoning errors other than the use of an improper logical form, like if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then C is equal to A. It's the other kind of issue. Um, and by the way, a fallacious argument may be deceptive by appearing to be much better than it really is. So one big one, post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? Uh, because this happened, this happened. The rooster crowed in the morning, therefore the sun came up. Therefore the rooster caused the sun to come up. Everyone would agree that's ridiculous. But, uh, you know, I, I had a really bad headache and I took this homeopathic medication and then two hours later, my headache was gone. Therefore, proof, homeopathy works, right? Use of anecdotal evidence. Hey, other people tell me that homeopathy works, has to be true. Appeal to popularity. A lot of people tell me that homeopathy works. Or in the case of religion, a lot of people believe in this God, therefore it's true. And by the way, they've believed in it for thousands of years. So therefore it's true. And also a very common one, the argument from ignorance. Oh, we don't know how that happened. Science doesn't have an explanation for it. Therefore, I know the explanation. It's aliens made crop circles or they built the pyramids or God created the universe. Right, so 
in my long presentation, I actually go into a lot of these in detail with examples. But some of my sources were this one, Log logicallyfallacious.com, a great site with 300 comprehensive uh, examples. I put a, a series out on 8 by 11 sheets, and it's on that URL on Facebook. Uh, each one could be printed. It's the 52 that I thought were most common. Uh, the Skeptic Zone did 40 at that URL. And uh, Wikipedia even has a list of fallacies. So what I hope you got from this talk was due to our flawed senses, the computational limitations of the brain, the less than perfect memory, that what you think you remember experiencing must always be suspect. And this is also, and one might say, especially true for claims, extraordinary claims made by others, right? Uh, and especially for those which contradict what science has uncovered about the nature of reality. Our natural thinking process is flawed in many ways. It's heavily influenced by cognitive biases. It's easily subjected to fallacious reasoning. And by understanding that, you can inoculate yourself from harm. Final bottom line, understanding our fallibilities and altering those that we can by critically thinking will lead to holding truer beliefs and to making better decisions. So as I mentioned, I have a longer version of this presentation. Uh, I did it twice. This is actually the longest one, which goes into the Mandela effect quite a bit. It's at that URL. If anyone's interested in looking at my skeptical inquirer column, uh, I have articles on all sorts of things. It's at that. And if you've got a, uh, a smartphone out, you can snap that right now and uh, follow me on Facebook. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Arvind has a question. Um, I don't know if this is a question uh, specifically for Bob, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just wanted to pick your brain on what you thought about this. Uh, the skeptic uh, brand and the name is being taken over by vaccine skeptics and anti-vaxxers and everything. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on how we can reclaim that skepticism is not anti-science, it's actually pro-science and this is anti-religion or whatever other uh, conspiracy theories, that's what we gather here today. But you just say the word skeptic nowadays, it's being misbranded as an anti-vaxxer. What do you think on that? Yeah, interesting question. It, it's not just nowadays, by the way. Uh, when I first became a skeptical activist, one of the first articles I wrote was on keeping my skeptic card because I had just branded myself with my column in Skeptical Inquirer as the well-known skeptic, printed business cards or hefty 50 bucks. And then Sharon Hill came out and said, I don't want to be called a skeptic anymore. It's a bad word. And I wrote an article about her saying that. And uh, you can look that up on Skeptical Inquirer. Uh, as I'm keeping my skeptic card is what I wrote. And it also has a link to Sharon's article if you're interested in why she's got that opinion. So it, it, it's been an ongoing thing for you know much longer than even then, uh, clearly. And it is a problem because the word has multiple meanings. Um, but what I, what I, one thing I wrote in the article was, um, you know, people make the word atheist out to be a bad word. So for a while, people who you know, had self-identified that way, said, oh, we need a new word because it's been branded badly. Let's call ourselves the Brights. That did not go over well. Uh, so yeah, it's always a problem trying to rebrand because the word, the word definitions change. And if you were to pick a new word, it would become the same meaning shortly in any case. So my pushback was, let's not do that. As how do you stop other people from using it incorrectly? I don't know. That, that's a good question. And Terry Karp. Thanks, great talk. Um, I always wonder, are things getting better or worse? Are older people more susceptible to these theories? Or, I'm, I mean, I do know uh, young people who are susceptible, uh, but what's your feeling? Oh, I'd actually like to hear uh, uh, Klaus and Steen talk about that too, but uh, it, it's hard to know. I mean, I hear this talked about in the Skeptics Guide to the Universe a lot. Have we been wasting our time? We've been doing this for whatever, 10, 12 years. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And of course, we don't have the double blind test of another earth where there wasn't a skeptical movement pushing back to know if it would be a lot worse. Our feeling is, yes, it would be. Uh, but, you know, we don't can't prove that as skeptics. Um, in, in some regards, I, I do think it's getting worse. Um, it, it, it's partly because of the Internet, like the Internet clearly gives people the uh, capability to meet up with other people who believe the same way and that that's the bandwagon effect it reinforces it right there are people who are called targeted individuals oh they call themselves that they think they're being um surveilled 
by nefarious forces all the time, 24 hours a day. If they leave their house, they come in and they take apart their smoke detectors and TV because they think bugs have been planted. They go to a restaurant, they think people are all there just to watch them and report on them, right? They used to be lone individuals with a delusion. Now there are clubs of these people, like giving each other PDFs, proving it to each other. Uh, so that's the bad part of having worldwide access that we do the internet. Of course, the good part is people can go and look at skeptical information by simply Googling it. Where this is all going to come out, I don't know. Uh, Steve, Steve Savholm, you have a quick question. Yeah, yeah, because you called on me, Rob, and yes. I'd like to comment on that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a primary school teacher, uh, so you also probably know, uh, thinking about your talk, uh, Terry, that, um, that, that the world is getting more and more uh, complex and complicated. So in my opinion, there's more need of uh, a direct education into skeptical thinking. Uh, critical thinking. We need that as, as a subject in, in, in the primary school, I think. Not just, uh, it's just not covered by, uh, at least not here in, in Denmark, it's not covered by history teaching or uh, language teaching or uh, teaching about the society. Uh, you need uh, simply a, a topic or a subject that's called uh, either critical thinking or uh, skepticism or something like that, uh, because the world is so complex now, uh, especially with the with the internet and uh, and, and social media. Yeah, my, I have a presentation on the harm in believing in psychics, and actually, there's a video in there with James Randi talking about that specifically. That we need to teach this to young people. Back at a TED talk in 2003, I think. So yeah, that that's certainly something that's been true and is still true. Um, Arvind had a comment about my comment. Snowden revealed that universal surveillance is no longer a conspiracy today. Well, I don't know if he's joking, but yeah, clearly individuals can be surveilled. But the, but the issue is these people think they're being surveilled and they have no reason to think they're being surveilled. And they're not surveilling everybody, right? These are people who are like, you know, I don't know, cashiers at, at a 7-Eleven. They have nothing that the NSA would be interested in, yet they think they're the center of the world. 